Hello, I'm John McDougall. I'm a medical doctor and an internal medicine specialist. I have the great privilege of bringing you this videotape of segments from a television show that I've been involved with for the past four years. These segments are short capsules of information that will inspire you to a healthier, happier life. The first segment is a bit longer than the rest. It was shot at St. Lena Hospital and Health Center in Northern California. It explains my background and philosophy. It's hard to imagine a more appropriate setting for getting well and staying healthy than the Napa Valley in Northern California. On a mountainside overlooking the valley is St. Helena Hospital and Health Center, operated by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Long a leader in lifestyle-oriented health plans, it's the home of the McDougall Program, a diet-centered approach to health conditioning directed by Dr. John McDougall. The program balances lecture sessions with nutritious meals and exercise. Steve Wynn investigates. I've never felt better in my life. Before I came to this program, I could hardly walk from the kitchen to the front room. But since being on this program for about eight days, I feel like a new person. I would recommend this program to any of my friends. I really enjoyed the people that were there in the program, the staff of the, the St. Helena Center. Dr. McDougall gives personal attention to each program participant, pointing out the signs of progress as his lifestyle plan begins to bring results. We wondered how he first came to focus so strongly on the role of nutrition in good health. A young man walked into my office and he said to me, Dr. McDougall, do you think diet has anything to do with the illnesses of your patients? Well, I said, absolutely not. And he said, well, how come you're so sure? And I said, well, look, I went to one of the best medical schools in the country. And I said, if it was important, they would have talked about it. And I said, they didn't mention it. So everybody who walked in the office, I would say, what do you eat? You know, ask them how they live. You know, and check their health over and so on. And I was in a very, very unique situation. I probably couldn't have duplicated this experience in any place else in the world. In his practice on a large plantation in Hawaii, Dr. McDougall witnessed the lifestyle contrast between different cultures and age groups. The insights he gained there helped to inspire his two books as well as the McDougall program. And what I saw were the first generation who stayed on a diet of rice and vegetables, no medications. They could see perfectly, they could hear perfectly. Trim, healthy, hardworking people into their 70s and 80s and sometimes 90s. Their kids were fat, they had the gout, the diabetes, the blood pressure, the heart disease, the cancers and so on that I had learned in medical school. So that gave me the first indication that disease is really not primarily an inherited thing. Members of the hospital staff provide specialized assistance to Dr. McDougall. Terence Hansen, Vice President for Health Programs, explains why this program is so welcome at the health center. Uh, the McDougall program fits very well with us philosophically uh, in the services that it offers and it, and it in, indeed expands uh, some of the people that we can help. The McDougall program is a lifestyle change program. It's a 12-day program. The people come here and stay. They live in the health center. Uh, they're taught a diet that's starch-based, high-complex carbohydrate diet. They exercise. They have group therapy. They uh, interact with each other and uh, have a good time. But the key thing is changing their lifestyle, and we give them the support to do that. They do have a full-service acute hospital here. but. The, the hospital administration is also committed to prevention. Surgery is just a band-aid. It takes care of the person now, buys a little time, but if they don't change their lifestyle, they end up right back on the operating table. The message that I try and get people to think of in terms of properly nourishing themselves is that there's a diet that best supports human health. And that diet is centered around starch, like rice or potatoes, or sweet potatoes, corn, taro, with vegetables and fruits. And then there's another category of foods called delicacies, which are the candy bars and the cakes and the chickens and the fishes and so on. If you think about it for a minute, that's the way it used to be. Mm -hmm. And you feast on occasion if you're in good health. But if you're in trouble because you've been feasting 21 times a week for most of your life, then you need to stop feasting for a while to get your health back. Herb and Jerry Harrison are recent graduates of the McDougall program. I think I noticed a change after about four days, and the principal thing was I had stopped taking all my pills by the third day, and the fourth day I felt just as good as when I was taking the pills, maybe even a little bit better. I have a greater outlook. 
my disposition's always been great, but I feel better anyway about it. Looking forward to the next day, and not necessarily the next meal, but the next day. I think one of the good things about the McDougall program that a lot of, uh, and this is a lifestyle, this is not a diet, but when, you're, when people start losing weight and start, uh, you know, in tendency towards dieting on this, that, you're given different quantities that you must weigh or you must count or you must, you know, do something like this. And with this, you just eat, you know, the quantity of food that you want of any particular food. And that's, uh, that's different and still losing weight, so that's a plus. A demonstration that I like to give people is to show them these glass stomachs. And these stomachs uh, are, are representations of what the actual stomach looks like as far as size. And each of the stomachs contains 500 calories worth of food. Now, you're trying to fill the stomach up. If you have 500 calories worth of salad dressing, it's just a little puddle in the bottom of the stomach, and it doesn't fill anyone up. 500 calories worth of meat or cheese, likewise, is hardly any filling at all for that stomach. Whereas when you get into rice and corn and potatoes, they really start to fill the stomach up when you put in four to 500 calories of these foods, and that's what you're looking for. And one of the questions that comes up is... Dr. McDougall offers kind of solid uh, evidence to support his approach to total wellness. It's a diet that's described in the Bible, and actually the medical treatment I use is clearly laid out in the first chapter of Daniel when Daniel took his men who were living in the king's care and he said to the gatekeeper he said let's do an experiment very scientific let's do an experiment let's take these men who are living under the king's roof eating the rich foods and let's put them on pulses and water which are vegetable and water and they agreed and ten days later they evaluated their experiment and their complexions were clear and their health was returned once they gave up the rich food 2,500 years ago, people made that observation. It's as true today as it was then. And you know something? In about 10 days, we get almost everybody off of blood pressure pills, diabetic medications, heart medications, and they've lost a considerable amount of weight in that period of time. Mm. I suppose I should just give Daniel the credit, right? Each year, 1.25 million people have heart attacks that could have been prevented. Fortunately, you don't have to be one of these statistics if you listen to the advice of the experts you're about to hear. Afterwards, I'll give you some timely information about aspirin and fish oil. Bob, uh, can you tell me how you got interested in the aspect of children and heart disease and cholesterol? Well, actually, my interest in heart disease began with a family history of my own. My dad had died at 57 of a coronary. Both his brother and sister have uh, the same disease. At 35, I had a heart attack and bypass. At 41, I had a second bypass. That led me to a real investigation of ways to get cholesterol under control, since cholesterol was the culprit. I was able to do so very well for myself, and then just very uh, recently after my second bypass, I had my son tested. Ross's level at age 7 was already elevated and I realized that something had to be done. I went back to the literature and found out that, in truth, America is sitting on a bit of a time bomb in terms of our children. You know, most people think that heart disease is a disease of 40, 50, 60 year olds. But what you're talking about is the disease of little kids. Let's talk specifically. I mean, actual foods that raise cholesterol. The foods that raise cholesterol the most are the saturated fats. Those are the ones found in butter fat, cheese, whole milk, ice cream, red meat. Uh, we also see it in coconut oil, some of the hidden oils that are used in shortening, coconut oil, palm, palm kernel oils. Those are highly saturated, but also the actual cholesterol in food, in egg yolks and so forth, the animal foods, all of these raise cholesterol levels. And we really should make a concerted effort to bring those down in our diets. Common advice, Bob, is to switch from red meat to chicken and fish. Lots of Americans are doing it. Actually, how much cholesterol are they getting when they switch from red meat to chicken and fish? The cholesterol content isn't that far off. It'll be just about the same within a reasonable number of milligrams. The difference is in the saturated fat. So the recommendation is quite uh, prudent to cut back on the amount of red meat. Doesn't mean you have to eliminate it entirely, but cut it back considerably 
replace it with fish, with uh, chicken, with poultry of all sorts. Uh, definitely go into some of the dried beans and peas. Go back to some of the old traditional ways of cooking, lentil soup, split pea soup, those delicious barley stews and so forth, because those foods not only don't raise cholesterol, they actually lower it. Bob, how about parents who don't want to feed their kids turkey and chicken? They have health concerns about these foods. What about those parents? Are they doing all right? I think that's per perfectly fine. It's a, it's a matter of finding what fits you. And I address the issue of the vegetarian diet, for example, within the book. I think it's a very healthful way of living. Uh, for those who want to do so, it's a wonderful way to stay healthy and happy for the rest of your life. Dr. Blankenhorn, you're one of the world's experts on atherosclerosis. I think we ought to start by telling people exactly what atherosclerosis is. John, it's a pleasure to be here. Now, what atherosclerosis is, is a buildup of cholesterol and scar tissue on the inside of arteries that interferes with the passage of blood. So we're talking about closing those arteries down. Right. All right, what's the consequence? The consequence is the common heart attack, the myocardial infarction, it's called, or stroke, or the like. Those are the major consequences. All right. And is this a very common thing to happen to people in this country? Yes, as you know, it's the common cause of death in this country today. All right. How about somebody like me, somebody who's young, trim? Could I have atherosclerosis? Yeah, the chances are you have less than uh, somebody who smokes or who has high blood pressure or high cholesterol, yeah. All right, so the chances are I might have it. Uh, say I didn't want to have any more of it. You got any words of wisdom on how I might stop Well, yeah, stopping? the words of, I'm sorry to cut you off here. The words of wisdom I had were, I have are that uh, uh, you should lower your cholesterol, you should get your blood pressure down, and you should never smoke. All right. Now, one of the key words that you mentioned is something that everybody's hearing a lot about, and that is to lower their cholesterol. What we're talking about is blood cholesterol here. How do I get my cholesterol lower without uh, just wishing it so? Right. The, the things to do are to eat the right diet, eat low cholesterol, low fat foods, and those are principally the vegetables, and then avoid the uh, high cholesterol foods, and the high, one of the highest is the egg yolk. All right. Uh, what about if what if I just want to have no cholesterol on my diet? What would I eat? Well, you can eat uh, a very reasonable diet with very small amounts of cholesterol. And the thing to do is to limit the amount of uh, meat you're eating and go for low-fat dairy products. Okay. Now, say uh, we were going to talk about ideals here, and I decided to watch my cholesterol level, and the object was to lower that cholesterol level. What's my goal? I think you should have a cholesterol of at least about 150. That's a good goal. 150, 150 milligrams per cent. All right. I eat no cholesterol in my diet. My cholesterol is 220. What do I do next? Well, in that situation, you need to consult with your doctor, and there are some people whose cholesterol levels are set high by their metabolism, and then they need medical care, and they need to take drugs. So cholesterol-lowering drugs. So the diet first, and then cholesterol-lowering drugs, and my goal is to get it down to 150. What's the prize if I do? The prize is you're going to have uh, no uh, increase in your atherosclerosis, and I think you find your disease is reversible. So, in other words, my arteries are going to get healthier and stronger? Right. Am I going to open up those holes so the blood can go through easier? I think so. All right. How about strokes and heart attacks? my wife going to have a husband a little longer? I think she will. I think you'll cut your risk. Uh, you can cut it way down. Okay. Let me see if I've got this right. We're going to watch our blood cholesterol. We're going to eat healthy foods. We're going to get some exercise. We're not going to smoke. I mean, that sounds like a message that nobody could argue with. John, I agree with you. Thank you very much for being here, Dr. Blankenhart. I mean, to present such a positive message to our viewers has been a real pleasure for me. We hear talk these days about the possibility of reducing heart disease and stroke by using aspirin. Is that right, John? There's some truth in that, Dan. And it's important information for people to know about and to put in perspective. Now, this all started about 20 years ago when scientists discovered that if you take aspirin, what happens is that aspirin inhibits blood clotting by inactivating platelets. And what happens is, in a sense, the blood becomes thinned out and has less tendency to form clots. Now, that's important because what happens in the final stages of a heart attack is one of those heart arteries forms a clot, no more blood can go through, and the little heart muscle dies. And so if you can inhibit that clotting, if you can prevent the blood from sticking together and form those clots, which you can do with aspirin, then you should be able to reduce your risk of heart attack. Now, there have been many studies done, and the general conclusion is this. 
if you take aspirin on a regular basis, and we're talking here usually about every day, if you take aspirin every day, then you reduce your risk of a non-fatal heart attack or stroke, that means not dying but suffering, by about 30%. How many aspirins would you say? Well, it depends, you know. It's interesting, when they did studies taking three aspirin a day, they didn't get any better results than when they took one aspirin a day. You reduce your risk of dying of heart attack and stroke by about 15%. Now, knowing that you have a variation in dose, what we have to consider now is we have to consider what happens when you take large doses or any dose. Because when you take drugs, you know, there are effects that you want, positive effects, and then there are side effects. Aspirin has side effects. What are those? Well, you know, people get indigestion, burning gastritis. They get irritation so bad in the stomach because they bleed and sometimes they can hemorrhage and it could be fatal in very rare cases. Some people are allergic to aspirin. So it's not without consequences that you make the decision to take aspirin to prevent heart disease. Now, some of the better decisions that I think you can make, because I don't think you need three aspirin a day. As a matter of fact, you do just as well by the studies with one aspirin a day. And one thing you might want to know is even taking one little baby aspirin a day will inhibit all the plates, platelets in your body and then it should be just as effective as an adult aspirin to take. Now, you also have choices in adult aspirin. You can take the regular adult aspirin or you can take the coated adult aspirins and the coated adult aspirins are easier on the stomach. So there are some choices for you there if you do decide that that's the way you want to deal with heart disease. I hear you saying that we're not dealing with an aspirin deficiency though in this problem. Exactly right, Dan. I mean, heart disease is not due to lack of aspirin in our system. It's, it's a treatment is what it is. What we ought to be doing is we ought to be doing, dealing with the cause of the problem. And the cause of the problem we know, the Heart Association tells us, and uh, other scientists and doctors tell us, and it has to do with the cholesterol and fat in our diet, the amount of meat and dairy and eggs that we eat. We ought to change those rich eating habits to eating no cholesterol and low-fat foods like rice and potatoes and fruits and vegetables, and then we're dealing with the problem. So the problem was with the spoon and the fork and the knife and not because we poke ourselves in the heart with it. You got it. You got it. Thank you very much, John. The health trend in America's diet is to replace beef with fish. But consider these foods have nutritional characteristics that are very similar. They're all muscles. Basically, we're talking about the muscle of a cow, a pig, a chicken, or a fish. They're high in fat and or high in protein. They're low in fiber, contain no carbohydrate, and they're highly contaminated because they're high on the food chain. And one thing that will really surprise you is they all are very high in cholesterol. You should keep fish as a delicacy just like you would chicken and beef and pork. The active ingredient in fish is the fish oil, and manufacturers put these oils in pills and sell them to you in drugstores and health food stores. Now, there are some positive effects of these fish oils. They do lower your cholesterol, and they will lower your triglycerides, and people who have arthritis will experience benefits. It will decrease the inflammation of the arthritis. But there are some adverse effects to these pills, as there are with so many other pills, and you ought to know about the downsides taking fish oils for your health problems. Fish oils are very high in calories. These oils are the highest concentration of calories that you can buy. What we're talking about here is we're talking about a pill that contains solid oil. I've had patients who have decided to take fish oils as a treatment for their cholesterol, and they have gained eight pounds in two months. Other adverse effects of fish oil is the way they work is they thin your blood, and some people can get bleeding tendencies when they take fish oils as a treatment of disease. Remember the time-honored fish oil, cod liver oil? We're talking about an oil that has very high levels of vitamin A and D, and some people can develop vitamin A and D toxicity. There are better ways of dealing with your health problems. Instead of taking a pill to solve your cholesterol and triglyceride trouble, instead of taking a pill for your arthritis, deal with the cause of the problem. Cut the cholesterol out of the diet. Eat a healthy diet that supports your health. This health phase all started with the Eskimos. Sure, they have less heart disease, but they've got other problems. They have problems with obesity. They have the highest incidence of osteoporosis in the world. There's a better choice, and the choice is, is to use fish for what it really is. It's a delicacy. It's something for special occasions. It shouldn't be the center part of your meal plan. Instead, what you should do is center your meals around starches like rice and potatoes and add fruits and vegetables. And use fish for a very small part of your meal plan 
just like the Asians do. And then you'll enjoy good health, very low risk of heart disease, and you'll look and feel good just like you should. The rich American diet places a tremendous burden on our health, and the result is an epidemic of illnesses that include high blood pressure, osteoporosis, and adult type diabetes. My interview with author and medical expert, Dr. Julian Whitaker, leads things off with some pretty startling information. In this country, about 5% of the population, or about 6 to 7 million people, suffer from diabetes. 90% uh, of those 5 to 7 million people have what we call non-insulin dependent diabetes. In other words, they have a type of diabetes that does not require insulin injection. Do you have any idea what causes diabetes? Well, back in the 30s, it was demonstrated that if you have a lot of fat in your diet, that the fat causes the insulin that is being produced by the pancreas to be insensitive. So basically, because the American diet is so high in fat, we eat food which blocks the sensitivity of insulin. Many of these diabetics, uh, John, actually have an elevated insulin level in the blood, along with elevated blood sugar, which is like a misnomer. But in reality, because of their obesity and because of the high fat in their blood, the insulin doesn't work and the blood sugar level goes up. Would you expect that people who eat lower fat diets in other parts of the world are going to have less diabetes? Not only would I expect that, but that is exactly true. You take countries like Japan or particularly countries in, in Africa or the undeveloped countries which are eating primarily carbohydrates, low in animal protein and low in fat, diabetes is not only rare, it is almost unheard of. Now, what you're telling me is that we can prevent adult-type diabetes by staying away from the fatty foods. What if we take somebody who already has diabetes, an adult diabetic, what if we change them to that other kind of diet, that low-fat diet where diabetes is so rare? What would happen? Well, that's what we've been doing. We've been doing that for almost 15 years, where we'll take the obese diabetic and put him on a low-fat diet, exercise regimen, and in those, you can get about 80% of them off of insulin if they're taking insulin, and if they will follow the regimen continually, the tendency towards diabetes will just be eliminated in 80 to 90 percent of those individuals that follow the regimen. How about the patients? Do you think if they knew about this option, they'd do it? Now, we're dealing with human beings, and when you ask people to make changes, you know and I know that sometimes they'll make changes for a while, and then they'll backslide, and they'll, they'll, they'll remotivate, and they'll rededicate, but in general, what we try to do is to offer them the best uh, approach so that they understand that there is an option. Then they can take more responsibility for their care, more responsibility for their health, more responsibility for their success. And they're not kind of tied to a paternalistic system where they check in regularly just to get medication. Dr. Swank, just to start off, could you give us a capsule summary of what multiple sclerosis is? Well, it's a disease which involves primarily the central nervous system that is the brain and spinal cord. And clinically, it is, uh, is characterized by uh, period, periodic attacks in which uh, some neurological symptom develops and stabilizes and then followed by what we call a remission. In other words, the condition gets better. Sometimes it gets very much better so that the patient considers that he's completely recovered. Other time, he only gets partially recovered from the attack. These attacks keep on recurring periodically, on average about one per year per patient over the long haul, and uh, they can involve um, any, any part of the nervous system involved. There can be blindness, for example, of one eye, double vision, for example. There can be uh, numbness and tingling of extremities, or weakness of a leg, or stiffness of a leg. There can also be a lot of um, in coordination so that the hands will shake violently or even the body and the head will shake violently. And uh, then, of course, uh, dizziness is a common enough symptom. Uh, these uh, symptoms come uh, with varying intensity and then disappear. And uh, as the disease progresses over a period of years, the patient gradually becomes uh, disabled and uh, finds that he can no longer walk or has great difficulty walking and finally may come to a wheelchair and then continue, of course, to slowly deteriorate. Do you know of any effective treatments to stop multiple sclerosis? 
Yes, I believe so. We use a low-fat diet in the treatment of these patients. We've been using it now since 1948, and uh, we have a series of patients, 150 patients, which we have followed for uh, going on to 40 years now, and which was reported at the end of 34 years of treatment. And these patients who were started early enough on treatment before they were disabled have done exceedingly well, and most of them have avoided disability. Now, you've just explained to us the benefits of a good diet and a good lifestyle and multiple sclerosis. These are simple things that patients can do for themselves. I want to know about treatments that doctors give patients, like medications. Are those effective? Well, no, I don't believe so. Uh, there's been a great deal of uh, prednisone and other corticoid, corticoid, cortical, uh, other steroid treatments used, and uh, ACTH, uh, the uh, material which stimulates the production of, of uh, corticosteroids. Uh, these have been used, and they do, on occasion, give some benefit short term. But in the long-term treatment of the disease, they are useless. And also, they are apt to produce a lot of nervous tension, which is sometimes is counterproductive in these patients. Now, in practical terms, what have you seen happen to multiple sclerosis patients that accept this low-fat diet? In practical terms, they do very well. If you can make the diagnosis early and get them on diet early, they do exceedingly well. And our statistics in the group of 150 patients which we treated over a period of 40 years and which we reported at the end of 34 years is that 95% uh, of the early cases, those who are not disabled, uh, who followed diet carefully, 95% of them were ambulant and quite active at the end of that period. And how does this compare with patients who do not follow a low-fat diet? Well, at the end of that period, 90% of them approximately were dead. And those patients who maintain a low-fat diet can expect to remain at the same activity level? 95% of them were essentially the same. There was a factor of aging coming in here because they were now approaching 90, 70 years of age and they weren't quite as active as they were when we placed them on the diet, but they still uh, had, they were no more disability, disabled than the average person at that age. How strictly do you have to follow this low-fat diet? That is the problem. The problem is that the patient has to follow it strictly and steadily. Now, there's an interesting thing that happens here that I think we should bring out. That is, if the patient doesn't follow the diet strictly, in other words, he's 10 grams or 20 grams over the diet, he will not have an increase in exacerbations. He'll go along just the same way without an exacerbation, and we'll get the idea that he can eat that much fat without getting into trouble. But actually, what happens is he soon starts going downhill rapidly, and once that starts, you know, it's very difficult to stop. What kind of dietary regime do you work out for people who come to see you with MS? We've worked this out pretty carefully at, uh, and have published it in book form. Uh, it's a diet which contains less than 15 grams of fat, of animal fat, and we uh, have substituted, a, we've not insisted, but we have recommended that the patients uh, eat uh, somewhere around 15 to 20 grams of oil, that is a vegetable type oil, and it contains about 60, uh, 60 to 80 grams of protein and the rest uh, carbohydrates uh, as much as a patient needs in order to keep up their energy and to meet the requirements of the of the job in life. Today I have the very great privilege to introduce you to the man who opened my eyes about the cause of disease and also the possible cure of common diseases that affect people in our country. This was back in 1971 that I met Dr. Dennis Burkett. Dr. Burkett, welcome to the show. Can you tell me when and what kind of training that you received? Kennedy College Dublin between 1930 and 35. I went up to the medical school, I went up to the university in Dublin in 1929, decided I'd do anything in the world except be a doctor or a dentist. And I, I, I entered the engineering school and I did engineering for a year. 
And it was during my first year I felt very definitely called to give it up and take up medicine, and I have never, ever for one moment regretted that decision. I was a surgeon fundamentally for all my professional life, but over the last 20 years, just over, I, got, I switched entirely from trying to cure disease to go 100% into trying to prevent disease. Because it wasn't until I came back from 20 years surgical practice in Africa that I was helped largely by others to appreciate that most of the common chronic diseases filling the hospital beds in Western countries today are rare or unknown in the third world were there even in North America before the First World War, are equally common in black and white Americans, and therefore they have to be due to our lifestyle, the way we live, and in which case they've got to be preventable if we can identify the factors in our lifestyle. All right, now you discovered the relationship between diet and disease from your experience in Africa and looking around the world. Now, what exactly is the part of the diet that you identified as the cause? To begin with, we talked about fiber, but then we realized we were far too blinkered. If you look at the, the diet of disease of the countries throughout the world who don't get the common diseases of Western culture, and when I say the common diseases, I mean diseases like atherosclerosis, diabetes, gallstones, bowel cancer, breast cancer, hemorrhoids, varicose veins, and particular disease, huge pile of stuff. The countries who don't get these diseases have a diet with far more starch, far more fiber, far less fat, far less sugar, far less salt. And the two major things we need is to eat more fiber and less fat. All right, now if you were going to advise people on the diet to eat, what kind of meal plan would you tell them to eat? The two most important ones would be to eat far more fiber. The average American eats 15 grams a day. Our ancestors used to eat over 100. In much of the third world, they eat over 100. The first thing would be to eat more fiber. The second thing would be to eat far more starch. Now, people are afraid of starch. They think starch is fattening. It's never fattening. More bread, more potatoes, more pasta. Uh, all those starchy foods, and, and more fiber and more starch. Then, far less fat. I think that might almost come top of the list. We eat 45% of our total energy as fat, and it's nearly all saturated animal fat. Um, if we could cut down our fat by going, say, shall we say, on the skim, semi skimmed milk, um, a vegetable um, margarines rather than butter, and abolish fried food as far as possible, and something which we've only recently recognized is that meat grown on the farm in our country or yours has seven times as much fat on the carcass as wild meat, and five times as much of that fat is the more dangerous saturated fat. Okay, in terms of practical everyday foods, can you give us some foods that you'd like to see people eat more of? I think we ought to eat far more foods made of cereals in general, particularly bread. Our ancestors ate between a pound, about a pound and a quarter per head per day of bread, always brown flour. We in Europe, in England, eat under a quarter of a pound a day. I think bread is a, a brown bread, not white bread. Brown or wholemeal bread is a very healthy diet. I like to see. Now, peas and beans are extraordinarily good because they're high in soluble fiber which is good from the point of view of diabetes and coronary heart disease. I think potatoes are very good. They're high in potassium. And Western man is the only mammal alive who eats more uh, sodium than potassium. I think potatoes, as long as they are neither cooked or eaten with fat, are a slimming diet, they're very nutritious. They tell me that there's almost no other diet which can contains almost everything a human being uh, needs. I, I mean, vegetables and fruits are all good, but most fruits, of course, is 98% water, so you don't get a lot of a lot of um, uh, fiber in it. Um, but it, also, uh, cereal is a good source of protein. I'm not a dietitian. I'm just, I mean, I'm a surgeon who's coming by the back door, but <laughs> this is just what I think about it. 
I think of osteoporosis, and I think of a little old lady, if I can say that, curled up over a cane. Dr. John McDougall is here to tell us if that's true, false, somewhere in between. When you say osteoporosis, what is it? Well, just the fact that you say you have that picture tells you what a common disease it is, or at least the knowledge of it is so common. I think the first thing that we have to start out with is the fact that osteoporosis is a disease. In other words, it's not a natural part of getting older. The way women were designed is their bones are supposed to last till they're 80, 85 years old, just like the rest of their body. But the way it is today, you know, bones are dissolving away at 40, 45, 50, Why? 55. Well, there are lots of theories out there, and unfortunately, some of these theories are tied to business, to economics. For example, the idea that it's a lack of calcium. Very common. In fact, I would guess that most listeners out there believe that the problem is not enough calcium, and the solution is to drink extra milk and to take various kinds of antacids. Well, the popular press, and you see the commercials, they do indicate you take a certain antacid or you eat this or that, and it's going to make a difference. You really mention it. You see the commercials. Most of that message is commercial, either direct or indirect. You know, if you look through the scientific literature, what you find is the scientific literature tells us that there's plenty of calcium in the food. I'm talking about rice, potatoes, vegetables, fruits. There's plenty of calcium in the food. And adding extra calcium really doesn't make a difference as far as bone strength goes. And I think probably one of the most interesting things that's recently come out is an article in the British Medical Journal. It was January 1989. Two different issues they carried this article that was titled Calcium Supplementation of the Diet not justified by present evidence. And they go through and they review the literature on calcium intake and how it affects the bones. And their conclusion is, is calcium does not build stronger bones, as the advertisers would like us to believe. I mean, after all, what are they selling us? They're selling us lots of dairy products. They're selling us lots of antacids with uh, uh, calcium in them. They're selling us other types of calcium pills. Uh, they have a vested interest in it. Well, what about all of these other supplements we've got here well, on the table? These, these, these are calcium supplements. You know, they kind of fit in with the type of belief that people have in this country, and that is that diseases that we suffer from are due to deficiencies. And so people take supplements such as these. They take uh, megadose vitamins. They worry about getting enough protein and so on. But the truth of the matter is, Lena, is we don't know people with deficiency diseases. I mean, we don't have any friends with scurvy, beriberi, pellagra. None of your relatives went to the doctor with protein deficiency this year. What we have in our society are diseases of excess, such as excess calories. So that's causing the bones to weaken? Well, it's not excess calories. We have problems of excess calories, excess fat, uh, excess salt, and so on. It's another excess, a dietary excess that's washing the bones away. And in this case, it's excess protein intake particularly animal protein intake, and the studies that have been done since the 1930s show this. But I think one of the interesting things that people can relate to is worldwide occurrence of this disease. Think about the places where people consume the least calcium. I think to mind would come your a African and your Asian countries. And if you think about the teeth and bones of these people, you know, based on what you've seen in travels or travel logs, or if you study it like I have, you find the strongest teeth and bones are in your Asian and African people while they live in these countries and eat a rural type of diet where they have lots of rice and corn and uh, other types of grains and fruits, and meat intake is very small, and so is dairy product intake. In fact, they don't consume dairy products until they move to Western society. Well, I've certainly got to the age where I'm worried about this. Thank you very much for giving us the information. You would be amazed to find out how quickly what you eat affects your body. Dr. John McDougall is here to explain just, I guess, how amazed we should be. How quick is it? Tell me, have you ever known people who decided to skip lunch because they noticed they got sleepy and sluggish after they ate? I have. All right, now what I want to do is I want to explain to you what happens. If you sit down and eat a high fat meal, that fat in that meal has a direct impact upon how your blood flows. Now I want to show you something here on the screen and this is very important for you to watch. What we have is we have the blood circulation flowing here very rapidly. 
and it goes through the blood vessels and the blood cells they hit and they bounce off each other and they don't stick at all. The way it should be. Yeah, that's the way it's supposed to be. That's normal circulation. Now these tapes that you're looking at here are taken from guinea pigs, but we see the same thing in people when we look through the whites of their eyes. Now when you feed them a diet that has 67% of the calories as fat, then what you see is the circulation sticking together and sludging. And as a result, the blood flow is much decreased to the tissues. And what happens is you actually decrease the amount of oxygen in the blood by about 20%. That looks and like this, rush hour oh, now. This sludging effect lasts for hours. And actually the blood doesn't return to normal for about 10 to 12 hours. So what happens is somebody sits down and eats a typical American diet. Their blood cells stick together. They feel sleepy and sluggish. Well, that's, you know, a day-to-day -day impact. But can you imagine what would happen if you took somebody who had narrowed arteries to their heart or to their brain and you took and you caused the blood to sludge like this? What happens is people get chest pain, and they also get little tiny strokes as a result of that. So it's very important that we take and we feed patients who are sick from these diseases a healthy diet. What and that's that a low-fat diet. Well, that's a diet that has lots of rice and potatoes and keeps things like dairy products and meat products and even vegetable oils to a minimum. Otherwise, what happens is you get this sludging of the circulation and a, a serious compromise in the patient's health. Now, it's unfortunate, Lena that if you have a friend or a relative that goes in the hospital and suffers a heart attack, that often the meal that they're served the next morning is one too high in fat content that could actually have an effect on the outcome of the patient. But people are learning about this. I mean, after all, we've come a long way in the study of heart disease. People know about cholesterol and they're learning about fat. And pretty soon they're going to understand the immediate effect of what you eat upon the circulation and proper changes are taking place. And if you have the option between skipping lunch and having a high fat lunch, skip lunch? Well, I got a better idea for you. Have something like a low fat soup or a sandwich that skips the butter and skips the cheese and instead has sliced tomatoes and lettuce on it. That's the way to go. Okay, I will remember that at lunchtime today. There are many nutritional myths that keep people from a healthy diet. For instance, if you believe milk and meat are necessary for a strong healthy body, you're going to find the next segments challenging. John, are vegetarians getting enough calcium? Definitely, Dan. Definitely they're getting enough calcium. And you know, I know a lot of listeners out there are thinking, well, he's talking about vegetarians that consume lots of dairy products. No, I'm not. I'm talking about vegetarians that avoid dairy products completely and instead have a diet with lots of rice and potatoes and various kinds of vegetables. Now, I know this is shocking, but it's very important that you get this message. For one reason, consuming some of those high source calcium products like dairy products could be dangerous. You've been told, for example, by the Heart Association that the fat in dairy products can lead to heart attacks and the Cancer Society tells you the way to reduce your risk of breast, colon, and prostate cancer is to cut down on dairy products. So you really need to know the honest facts about calcium in foods. Now the fact is this. Calcium is a mineral that's in the ground, just like other minerals, like iron, for example. And the way it gets into horses and hippopotamuses and, and people is it gets dissolved in the, in the ground into a uh, liquid, and it goes up into the roots of plants, and it becomes parts of the plants, like the leaves and the stalks and the fruits and so on. And then the elephant or the cow or the horse or the person comes along and eats the plant. And you see what huge skeletons some of these animals grow by just eating plants. Oh, wait a minute, you just, you just gave me a thought. Those elephants are getting that firsthand, and if we eat the dairy products, we're getting the calcium secondhand. That's, that's right, and we're getting also a lot of other things that we really don't want to have. Now, the way it works is this. We eat the calcium, okay, and it goes through our intestinal tract, and our intestinal tract has active cells that reach out and grab that calcium. Our intestinal tract is not a passive sieve. In other words, some people have the idea if you put more calcium in, then it's just going to go into the body. That's not the way it works. And fortunately, that's not the way it works. Not only does this active intestine guarantee that you'll always get enough calcium, and I know that, Dan, because there's never been a case of dietary calcium deficiency ever reported in people. I know you might be thinking about another disease, osteoporosis, but there never has been such a disease. If you take in too much calcium, that intestine also blocks out that excess calcium you took in. So the food is right, and our intestinal tract is right, and you can't lose, and that's what you need to know. The food is beautiful, John. The facts are interesting but challenging, and I just want to thank you for giving us this to think about. 
We hear a lot about the negatives of the typical American diet of meat and potatoes, a diet full of fats and cholesterol, and recently the Beef Council has taken the initiative in trying to convince us that beef is not so bad after all. What do you think about that, John? I think they're trying to convince us, Dan, I really do. I'd like to hear what some of their facts are. Well, here's a piece, 12 myths about beef, and let me just give you the first one here. It says, myth, beef is high in cholesterol, and it goes on to compare it with lots of other kinds of meat, like uh, roast chicken is even higher in cholesterol than is beef. Are they not telling us the truth? Well, they are telling the truth, and I think it's a message that we all have to get, and that is that depending on your comparison, pork and chicken can be higher in cholesterol than beef. But here we're talking about beef being 73 milligrams of cholesterol for three and a half ounces, and chicken being 74 milligrams, and maybe pork being 79. In other words, what they're telling us, Dan, is all these meats are essentially the same in their cholesterol level. And so many Americans out there, they believe that if they switch from beef and pork to, say, chicken and fish, they're lowering their cholesterol content in their diet, and they're not. So I have to thank the beef industry for pointing that out. All these muscles are very similar. In fact, if you look at this platter, Dan, what you see is they all look very similar. So we have pork, we have beef, we have chicken over here. We also have some other high cholesterol foods like your cheeses and your shrimps. Now, compare that, contrast that with the fruits that we have over here. Look at all the colors that we have here and the difference uh, in the shapes and the textures. And you can imagine the aromas and tastes would be quite a bit different. And so the beef industry is not lying to us, but we should look at their message and not look at it as an applause for beef, no. but as something that condemns the other products or puts them in their place. I mean, these things are supposed to be for special occasions if you eat them at all, like Thanksgiving. I've heard you tell us that we ought to have a very low cholesterol diet or a no cholesterol diet. So you would give us a different message about including any of this in our diet at all, wouldn't you? Yeah, I think, you know, it's a, it's a message that people stop and think about it for a minute. I mean, turkeys for Thanksgiving. And birthday cakes are for birthdays. And really, beef and pork and chicken and a lobster dinner should be for a very special occasion if you're going to have it at all. But you know something? I bet if you go around and ask people, you will find that most people have feasted enough for a lifetime. And they could take a break on feast for a while. Uh, now, are you telling me that uh, you would say turkey for Thanksgiving? Well, maybe you if want you it choose. for Christmas, too, and a lot of other. Maybe you have a lot of treats, though. Well, that's why Americans are in trouble. It's because they love birthday, and they love Thanksgiving. So they do it for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and they look like people who have a feast three times a day, 21 times a week, and those people are the kings and queens, you know, with the gout in their feet, they're fat, because they have taken this message from the beef industry and the rest of the, the food markets, and they've decided that this is fun food, and we're going to eat it all the time, and they get sick. Well, John, you've given us a lot of food for thought, and I'm sure our viewers are going to give some careful consideration to the counsel you have shared with us. So what do we got here, John? Looks to me like the diet point of this is you can't get your spoon into these dishes here. I've got a demonstration for you, Dan, that you're never going to forget. This is a demonstration that I give at St. Lena Hospital Health Center to the people I take care of. It's a demonstration that's going to prove beyond a doubt the problem is not that we eat too much. I mean, you hear that all the time, that the reason people are fat is because they eat too much. What I want to show you, and through your powers of observation, you will conclude it's what we eat, not how much we eat. Now, what I have here, Dan, is I have stomachs, and these are about the size oh, of really? your stomach. Yeah, these are glass stomachs. You've got to use your imagination a little bit, all okay. right? Now, what I'm going to allow you to do is to eat 500 calories per meal. And I'm going to give you different choices of food to fill your stomach with. And remember, all you get is 500 calories. For your first meal, Dan, I'm going to give you 500 calories of butter. Do you feel pretty satisfied? Do you feel like your stomach's Not, no, full? You can have it. You don't like butter. Okay. Well, I just want to show you what 500 calories of butter would do as far as filling your stomach. And this mm -hmm. could also be 500 calories of olive oil or salad dressing that have the same amount of filling. Not much, and you'd be very hungry and want more to eat. Now if we chose, say, 500 calories of meat, that's all the fuller your stomach would get on 500 calories of meat. You would still be yearning more to eat. Uh, are, you, are you telling me now what I'm responding to when I eat is hunger that is exhibited by the fact my stomach isn't full? That's right. The way you satisfy your hunger primarily is by filling up your stomach. And so that's what you want to accomplish at every meal is to fill up your stomach. The average person will burn uh, 1,500 to 3,000, or 
to 3,000 calories a day. And so if we divide the meals up into 500 calorie meals, it gives you some idea of what you might choose for, say, breakfast, lunch, or dinner. Here's 500 calories of cheese. Again, you know, you're not looking at very much to fill your stomach up. Now, these are what people often think of as dieting foods, as meat and cheese. But they don't do much as far as filling the stomach. Let's take a look here at 500 calories of rice. And that could be white rice or brown rice. Of course, brown rice is healthier. A lot more filling. You're a lot more satisfied. Here's 500 calories of corn. Now, that is a lot of food. And here, Dan, I couldn't put 500 calories of potatoes in here. I could only put 400 calories in. So you've got to imagine the extra potatoes sitting up here not able to fit in the stomach. So you see, Dan, when people switch from these types of foods that are so concentrated in calories to these kinds of foods that are so bulky and dilute in calories, what happens is dieting and weight loss is effortless. You want to get to dessert, I'm, right? I, I want you to get over here quick. All right. You have a choice. Here's 500 calories of a candy dessert. Not much satis satisfaction there. Or here you could have 500 calories of very colorful fruits for dessert. That's the kind of choice you have. Now, when people figure this out, that all you have to do is switch from the high-fat foods to the foods that are, are, that are plentiful in starches, vegetables, and fruits, they take in twice as much food and half as many calories. All of this is 500 calories. 500 calories. Uh, I'll start in right now. Thanks, John. There are certain things in life people don't want to give up, like the joy of dining out with friends or the convenience of fast food. Well, I say you don't have to give those things up. You just have to be smart about it. And here are some ideas. When we first talked about doing a segment for Christian Lifestyle Magazine on how to eat healthfully in restaurants, they asked me which restaurant I'd like to use. And when I told them, they were really surprised. You see, this is not the kind of restaurant one normally thinks of when they want to eat a vegetarian diet. But just between you and me, I like to eat in places like this, and let me show you why. I'd like to have baked potato, no butter, no sour cream. I want steamed vegetables. Again, hold the butter, rice pilaf, and I'd like the salad bar. Now, does the soup come with the salad bar? Yes. As a matter of fact, the pasta bar and soup bar comes with the entire fresh fruit and salad bar. Now, wasn't that easy? This is one of my favorite salad bars. I can just go crazy here. You start out with a little green salad, maybe add a couple extra tomatoes. You can uh, use some green pepper here. Now, you've got to be a little careful with the potato salad and some of the other salads because they're loaded with mayonnaise and oils. I like to add a few extra peas, uh, some wax beans, yeah? I like wax beans a lot. And some kidney beans and a little bit of corn, and we'll top it off with a few sprouts. And just for a little bit of extra flavor, we'll just sprinkle a little bit of this on. Now let's go see what's on the other side. Now, you notice we're going to pass this, which is full of a mayonnaise-type dressing, and, of course, pass the eggs up. And this salad doesn't look like it's so full of oil, so let's try a little bit here. And we'll pass the cottage cheese and the eggs and, oh, little trees. Love little trees. And maybe a couple onions and a few more green beans here. Now, I just I have to give up because my plate's full. And look what we have here, a vegetarian minestrone soup. Boy, was I happy to find out that they have noodles made without eggs here. And take a look at this marinara sauce. This is rich, red, delicious marinara sauce. I mean, how could you ask for anything tastier than this? Now, here's the rest of your order. Okay, maybe I did order a little too much. But you know, even if I ate all this, it's not going to do me any harm. If you're not a vegetarian, I'd like you to try eating like one for just one evening. I guarantee you're going to feel better. I'd like to thank Sizzler for their cooperation in this segment, and I'd like to thank all restaurants out there that serve healthy alternatives. Now, if you'll excuse me for a minute, I've got to get down to some serious eating. People are always telling me their lives are so busy they don't have time to eat right but I believe you could eat healthfully even in a fast food restaurant. And today I'm going to show you how. Burger King's new slogan is sometimes you got to break the rules. Let's go in and break a few. I'd like to have a Whopper. 
Now you say I can have it my way, right? Yeah. All right, I want a veggie whopper, and that means no meat. Okay, I'd like to have lettuce, tomatoes, onions, pickles, a little bit of ketchup, a little bit of mustard, and no mayonnaise. And I'd also like to have one of your garden salads with your low-calorie dressing. You remember the Wendy slogan, where's the beef? Well, who cares when you can eat like I do? Hi, I'd like to have a baked potato with broccoli, but no cheese. And um, I'd like to have the salad bar with lemon wedges. And how about a glass of water? At the salad bar, choose low-fat items. Mushrooms. Add carrots with lots of vitamins and minerals. Some cauliflower. A little bit of broccoli. Adds an interesting green color. Some sprouts. A few onions. I really love onions. Adds an interesting flavor. And we can put a few of these peas on the side. Now, don't ruin this delicious salad by dumping oil all over it. Pass right by these oily items, right down to the vinegar, and top with vinegar. Or you could use a lemon wedge. You'll have no trouble finding a delicious and healthy meal at Wendy's with a baked potato and a delicious salad. Uh, yes, I'd like to have a baked potato and salsa and also a glass of water. Thank you. Please drive forward. Yeah, I know. Another baked potato. But at least I had something healthy to order. Good times, great taste, and good health at McDonald's. Let me show you how. I'd like to have a garden salad, but I want you to leave off all the cheese and the egg. And I'd also like to have the light vinaigrette dressing. The garden salad contains 112 calories and 107 milligrams of cholesterol. By eliminating the eggs and cheese, you reduce the calories to less than 50, and you eliminate all the cholesterol. After all, your health deserves a break today. It's been a long day. Now let's see what we've learned. You could order a cheeseburger at more than 500 calories more than 100 milligrams of cholesterol. Or you could order a salad, a potato, or a sandwich with very few calories and absolutely no cholesterol. The choice is yours, and I know you're not too busy to make the right one. Now I've got to take these items home to my wife. It was a nightmare, like something from the Twilight Zone. I was out of control, a man possessed. I would do anything to get what I wanted, and then there it was. Pizza. Yeah, I know what you're thinking. How could I, John McDougall, espouser of the low-fat diet and all-around health nut, eat oil-drenched pizza? What if someone saw me? How could I face the humiliation? But a man's got to do what a man's got to do. And what would you like? I want a medium combination pizza. Everything on that? I want no pepperoni, no salami, no sausage, and no ground beef. Anything else? Yes, I want no cheese. What? No cheese. No cheese? Charlie, we got another weirdo out here. Then mercifully, I woke up, and the next day, I'd like to have a medium vegetarian pizza, no cheese. No problem. While I waited, I asked the manager why people eat cheeseless pizza. Some people have allergic problems to the cheese, and the other reason is for the fat and the cholesterol that's contained in the cheese. It's just another type of way to make a pizza. We've made them so many different ways, it's just another different way. 
Thank you. You're By passing up the cheese, I've eliminated 700 calories and 200 milligrams of cholesterol, but not a bit of good taste. Believe me, this pizza is a dream come true. Dr. John McDougall joins us now. John, what do you think about this business of laughter as a medical treatment? Well, I think there are better treatments than just laughter. I mean, I think we can make some conscious choices with our knife and fork. You know, knives and forks, they get out of control, Dan. Well, speaking of knife and fork, when I saw you laying all this out in front of me here, all I want is a spoon and get out of my way. Are you one of those ice cream addicts? I don't know that I'm an addict, but it's not a bad uh, interruption in a lot of other more mundane some, things. Some people tell me they'd die for ice cream. And so for those people, what do I do? You know, because they've made it very clear that they're not going to give it up. So what I thought I would do is I would uh, go to the store and see what kind of options people have. What's well, wrong with this stuff? I mean, it's light. It looks healthy. In fact, I buy well, some of Well, let's take it. a look at a few of them. First well, of listen, 93% fat-free? Yes, that's Hey, that, that's a good deal. It does. It sounds like a lot less fat. Actually, if you look at the uh, panel back here, you do a couple calculations, what you find is this is actually 36% fat. Now, that's better because the regular stuff is 50 to 60% fat. So, yeah, you've cut the fat in, well, almost half, not quite, with these light ice creams. Uh, there are yogurts that they make, but, you know, your yogurts can be 30 to 50% fat, too. And don't forget, when you're talking about animal products, and these are milk-based, then you're also talking about cholesterol. You're also talking about fiber-free. And, you know, sad to say, Dan, the way that they get the fat down as the sugar goes up. Yeah, but I've always felt, you know, you're entitled to a little bit of something like this after long, hard days and all of the dedication we have to our work and so forth. It's a treat, isn't it? Oh, yeah, sure. Okay, now I think that's important. We keep it as a treat. And we'll get back to that subject in a minute as this being a treat, which, you know, on special occasions you might want to do. But there are some other options. You know, you can buy sorbets, which are basically frozen fruit. But this one puts sorbet and cream together, and unfortunately, the cream does raise the calories, 190 calories per serving as opposed to 100 calories per serving for your light ice creams. And we do have uh, True Sorbet, which is a actual frozen fruit product. And this would probably be the best of the commercial products that you can buy. Uh, you do want a treat. But boy, I look at that. That's expensive stuff, John. All right. All right. So let's talk about an option here. How about just taking some frozen strawberries, and you buy them this way in a package. And let's take a banana, peel it first, in fact, a few bananas, peel them, put them in a saran wrap or a plastic bag and freeze them so we have some frozen bananas. And we'll take a common food processor, put a few strawberries, some bananas in, add a little bit of water, and just turn the fruit food processor on for a few minutes. And let's see what you think about this. Well, you better get with something here because you've got to take care of my appetite for a little bit of dessert. All right, now remember, no fat, no cholesterol. Is what we're talking about. Lena, how about you try that? Cheap. Thank you. It looks good. Now, it even looks like the real stuff, doesn't it? Give me a spoon, man. It's very good. I, I like it. I, I think it's a, it's a real option. And the bananas are frozen as well. The too. bananas are frozen. The strawberries are frozen. It's inexpensive. Mm. It's fast. It took, I really you know, like no it. no more than a minute to make this. And you've got the Delicious. fiber there yeah. from the banana as well, which is real healthy. You have the fiber and you have the natural sugars instead of the sugar that they put in all these products. So I really think that this is an option that people can have, at least on, on some occasions. Uh, the banana is the base in this. And then mm -hmm. you could add any kind of fruit you wanted to otherwise, you could, couldn't sure. you? You could have raspberries if you wanted. Mm -hmm. you, could have, um, you could have pineapple. Great options, John, when we start to thinking about uh, taking care of ourselves and keeping the cholesterol down and the calories down and so forth. And you know, you can still be an, an ice cream addict. Welcome to Old Faithful Geyser. No, it's not the one in Yellowstone National Park. It's the one in Calistoga, California. We recently did another segment here, so when I found out it was the source of much of the mineral water I drank, I decided we had to come back. The water in those bottles actually comes from a geyser like this one. A man named Giuseppe Masante found the geyser when he was digging for a well. The 350-degree water came out of the ground with such a force, it literally blew him off his feet. Knowing how good for us the minerals in the water are, and being an enterprising individual, he decided to bottle the stuff and sell it. His company is still here today. But things have changed since 1920. The main difference between mineral water and tap water is the number of minerals and trace elements and the concentration that they're in the water in. Like Calistoga, our product here, it's got about 
600 to 800 parts per million total dissolve solids, which means that there are a superabundance of naturally occurring minerals and trace elements. Is the water any cleaner? Well, I can't speak for everybody's product, but I can speak for ours. And <clears throat> our product comes out of the ground at 240 to 250 degrees, so it's boiling. And the source of, ca of calistoga is the magma, which is down by the core of the earth, the boiling molten part of the earth's center. That's where the water comes from. And it is extremely pure. Can you tell me why the popularity of mineral water is increasing? Because of people like you who believe in it and the people who watch your show who believe that good health is a necessity and are willing to, to take steps to ensure good health. We thank you. Part of the enjoyment of the water comes from the little bubble. How do the little bubbles get in there? Uh, we inject the little bubble. <laughs> Does that uh, change the water in any way? Not really. Carbonation is carbonation, whether it's naturally occurring or it's manufactured, which in our case, it is man-made. There are 38 naturally occurring minerals and trace elements in this water, and that's good for you. In fact, some people think heart disease is decreased because of the minerals. Americans consume 46 gallons of soda pop filled with sugar and artificial sweeteners every year, and that's not good for you. But why do I spend my hard-earned money on this water? It's because I like it. You know, I bet you think it's really strange to have a doctor who's always talking to you about good health to be standing here with a glass of wine. Well, you know, wine doesn't have to mean alcohol. I've tasted some very good wines that are non-alcoholic. I'm on assignment for Christian Lifestyle magazine to find out just how these wines are made. The way we really got, got started was I entered it in the Los Angeles County Fair in the Miscellaneous White Wine Division in 1986. In a blind tasting, they awarded Ariel the gold medal, and the other eight wines in the category all had alcohol. So they were completely shocked and embarrassed. And I laughed. I couldn't believe they did it either, but they did. This may not look like the little old winemaker, but Barry Nico is one of the world's foremost authorities on non-alcoholic wine. Barry, why non-alcoholic? Well, wine is a really good tasting beverage. Uh, it's been around for a long time, thousands of years. And a lot of people, myself included, a lot of times don't want the effects of the alcohol, but love the taste of wine. So tell me, what is the market for non-alcoholic wines? Who do you sell this to? Well, generally speaking, it's older people, people who are very familiar with wine. They know vineyards. They know, they know the different countries. They know the different flavors. They know the different wine types. And then for one reason or another, either health reason or personal reason, they're trying to cut way back on the amount of alcohol that they consume. And uh, they already like to taste the wine, so they're looking for this. Well, there seems to be a switch, you know, from hard liquor to beer and wine. Do you think this is just the trend? Absolutely. There's more social awareness of the effects of alcohol. Um, there's more people that are aware of situations when they shouldn't have alcohol, for instance, driving being the opposite. Um, and uh, there's a lot of people that are just uh, more concerned about their personal health. Non-alcoholic wine does have a little bit of alcohol in it. How much of this wine would it take for me to feel the effects? <laughs> you have to drink uh, approximately two and a half cases to get the same alcohol as you would in one six-ounce glass of wine. I don't think it can be done. That's, mm -hmm. a, lo that's a lot of alcohol. Yeah. Do I find that much alcohol in anything else? Uh, there's about the same amount of alcohol in our, our Ariel as there is in orange juice or apple juice or vanilla ice cream or yogurt or bread um, or cheese. Would you mind showing us how you filter the wine? No. Let's go out and look at it. This is the starting wine. This is the wine we start with, our fermented wine from the 1987 vintage. And as you can see, it has all the color and the flavor that wine would have normally. And then what happens is we take it through this filtration process into the hoses, into the machine, where uh, under high pressure and cold temperature, we filter the alcohol and the water out of the, out of the wine. And I'll take a sample out of it here. And this clear, clear water and alcohol liquid has nothing in it, no flavor, no aroma. All it has is the, is the alcohol in the water. And essentially, we throw that away. And all the flavor and the aroma and everything that, that is, 
evolved the taste of wine that's left in this glass here. For me, choice is an important issue, and I'm sure glad I have a choice when it comes to wine. For instance, I chose this one for Dan Elena, and this one for my wife. This is Dr. John McDougall. See you next time. I've said it before, and I'll say it again. Eating healthy is really simple. And to prove it to you, I'm going to show you how I take care of myself when Mary goes on vacation. One of the simplest meals is breakfast. And one of my favorite breakfasts is potatoes. And since I don't like to cut, I just pour. And after adding a few potatoes, I'll add a few onions just for color and for taste. And then a couple of stirs. Cover them up and let it sizzle. Oatmeal is also one of my culinary skills. You just pour it in and put it on the stove. While this is cooking, I'll go check my potatoes. See, they get nice and brown in this nonstick pan without a drop of oil. Now let's go cut some fruit. Cantaloupe is a colorful, nutritious addition to my breakfast. Now what could be simpler? These are as good as any potatoes I get in the restaurant, and a lot better for you. Just how I like it. Just add a few dried fruit to my oatmeal, and then my favorite barbecue sauce. Yeah, I said barbecue sauce. Now, that's a healthy, hearty, and a simple breakfast. Once you understand the principles of healthy eating, your next questions will be, where do I find acceptable food? Do I always have to shop at a health food store? What about meat substitutes like tofu? Overwhelmed? These next segments should be a big help. The Great Harvest Bread Company makes wonderful bread without using oil. Most bakeries will do this for you if you just ask. Let's go in and find out more. Good morning, John. Good morning, Steve. Would you like a slice of bread? I'd like a slice of bread, and I also want to see Dave. You here? Sure is. I'll go get it. Great. Thanks a lot. Good morning, John. Good morning, Dave. How are you? Good, thank you. Welcome. Hey, listen, anybody who comes in your bakery instantaneously knows what a delicious bread you make. Can you tell us a little bit about the health aspects of your bread? First of all, John, we don't use any oil or egg or any other dairy products as additives in our bread. We also do our own milling here, which means we get our wheat as raw wheat, grind it into flour on the premises, ensuring that we have the freshest flour possible for all of our products. Can you tell me why it is those other bakeries find it important to use oils and butters and all those emulsifiers? I'm not certain, in all honesty, but I do think it uh, gives, keeps the bread a little more moist over time. Um, perhaps as protein supplements to give the bread more lift in the rising process. And other than that, I'm not sure. Maybe there's a belief in the baking industry that you have to add those things to bread. Okay, now that you don't have any uh, additives in your bread, that means you don't have any preservatives. Is your bread going to last? Yes, it does. Um, it keeps uh, seven to ten days, and I had reports of up to two weeks and even longer, uh, just at room temperature. Can you show us how you make your breads? I'd love to. It's a pretty simple process. It really starts with uh, wheat, and we get a premium grade wheat shipped to us from Montana. Uh, we mill that as needed every day here in the shop with a stone burr mill. And we combine it with whatever ingredients are you know, the bread style for that day. And then it sits for a few hours. Well, that's simple enough. Then I just pour it in the pans and it's bread? Just about. Right around 9 o'clock every day in our bakery, uh, the activity level really goes up. We collect ourselves here at the kneading table. And that dough has been fermenting, which is what the yeast does. It's a fermenting process, uh, giving the bread gluten strength, helping develop flavor and getting ready and ripe for a final knead by hand. Uh, we cut the dough into two pound, five ounce pieces, knead it by hand, which is, uh, punches out some of the gases in the yeast waste products, and shape it into a nice, pretty, symmetric loaf of bread. That kneading process looks like a, a lot of hard work. It is. We have a good time at the kneading table, though. Everyone in the bakery comes together at one place, and we do some pretty hard physical work. From there, it goes into our, uh, our baking pans, and it does one more rise, on our uh, what we call a proofing rack and uh, that's truly a ripening process when they've gotten to just the right proofing the bakery term they've proofed just right we stick them into the oven for baking 
for around 45 minutes. This is almost like taking me back a whole century. <laughs> it is. We're trying to make homemade style bread, but at a retail level. Well, Dave, I have a whole new perspective of what healthy bread really is. I want to thank you very much. You're welcome, John. Here's one more for the oh, All right. Thanks, Dave. People often ask me, where do you shop for healthy foods? Their first thought is usually the natural food store, but I like to shop in my local grocery store. Now the foods in this section around me are obviously healthy. Let's go look at the rest of the grocery store and find packaged products that are also good for you. In the salad dressing section, you want to find a product with good taste and no oil. I like Herb Magic but there are also other good salad dressings. Be sure and read the labels first. I really like spice in my food. Therefore, I stop by the barbecue sauce and the steak sauce section. You gotta make sure there are no oils in these items either. I really like these things. And what do I do with all these tasty sauces? I don't put them on steaks. No, I put them on oil-free potatoes. Frozen fruits and vegetables are as good as the natural ones, but make sure they're not packaged with butters and creams. When it comes to dessert, try some natural frozen juice popsicles. My kids love these. Cereals with whole grains and no sugars are easy to find in a supermarket, but what do you put on them? Well, how about uh, some apple juice? I'm serious, try it. I like Wasa products, and I looked at all five of their crisp breads and found them to be of natural ingredients. And all were oil-free, except for the one that I expected to be healthiest and that's the Fiber Plus variety. It has oil. If you want to eat oil-free, it just shows you you can't take things for granted. An all-time favorite is pasta. In this case, our noodles are made of wheat, spinach, with no eggs. And if you don't have time to make your favorite spaghetti sauce, just find one made of tomatoes and spices. Manufacturers are responsive to our concerns for fats and oils, and they're making the right kind of products. For example, you can buy soups that are oil-free, or you can buy dishes in packages that you just have to add water to, and they're also oil-free. Now, your responsibility as a good consumer is to read the labels carefully. And if your supermarket is not carrying the right goods, then you talk to the manager. Tofu is one of my favorite foods, and I've been eating it for years but I don't know very much about it, and I don't know how it's made. And so I came to San Francisco to the Azumaya Tofu Factory to learn about it and to talk to President Bill Mizono. Tofu is very unique in itself. Uh, even though it's made out of a soybean, it has all the amino acids that meat has. It's high in protein and very digestible. Cholesterol? No, none. And if we go in the back, I'll show you how it's made. As you can see by this bin, with the beans in my hand, it goes to the uh, washer, and through the washer, it goes into the hopper, and through the hopper, it's soaked for 10 to 12 hours. Depending on the temperature, it'll, it'll become twice to three times the size. After it's soaked, the following day, we mill it with water. When I say mill, we grind it up. Then it's pressure cooked at a high, very high temperature, and then after it's pressure cooked for about 12 to, 12 to 15 minutes, it's then separated uh, with the pulp going in one direction and the juice going another. From the juice, we make the actual tofu. From there, it goes into these tanks, uh, which accepts the uh, soy juice with solidifier. And after 10 minutes, it's solidified. What is this man doing with this grape? What he does is he, he evenly distributes, distributes and breaks the the solidified tofu into this tray. He's transferring this tray onto a, a press. This press actually solid, uh, re-solidifies the tofu and presses the excess water out. From here, the man brings into a tank of, full of water, then he, he puts it into an automatic cutter. From there, it's cut and then placed automatically into a container. From there, as you can see, how the conveyor goes into this a very large pasteurizer. Uh, the complete process of pasteurization and, and chilling is an hour and 45 minutes. It sustains the shelf life for over 30 days. As you can see on the other end of this tank, uh, the two gentlemen are packing tofu, and this is the very last process of manufacturing tofu. And from here, it's off to the supermarket. 
Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Bill, that's very interesting. Any chance I can take some of this home to my wife? Certainly. Since you came all the way here, you're welcome to it. Our health and medical professional, Dr. John McDougall, is here today to talk to us about labels. John, we didn't want to show any particular products. So we took some beautiful packages. This bright red one had chocolate chip cookies in it. I depicted it because it was red and, again, because it had chocolate chips in it. Um, it's got a whole list of stuff that I can't even pronounce, let alone know what it means. Yeah, I, I imagine you're confused, Dan, but there are some things that you can make out of this. For example, the first thing you ought to know is that, by law, manufacturers are required to list the ingredients in order of appearance. So the first ingredient you see there is what is most in the package. And the second ingredient is the most, second most dominant ingredient. So you so, get some idea what's going on by the order of ingredients. So I picked this up and it says bleached flour. Yeah, that's what's most in there. You know, you'd rather have whole wheat flour. But keep going. I bet there's some other things yeah, in there. Yeah, that about like middle about. way. It says invert sugar, sugar, semi-sweet chocolate chips with artificial flavored emulsifier, brown sugar, corn syrup, molasses, on and on. All right, did you, did you listen to all those sugars, the molasses, the brown sugar, the invert sugar, the sugar? That's all sugar. Now, what the manufacturer did is the manufacturer broke those sugars up into individual names so that they could be listed further down on the ingredients list. If they listed it as all sugar, which it really is, it might have appeared first, and then, Dan, if you'd have picked it up and looked at it and you said, the first ingredient sugar, I'm not going to buy that. So it's a little trick that the manufacturers do. Here's another label uh, off of a very popular snack food. And uh, almost make my salivary glands work to think about it, too. But it starts off with uh, hydrogenated soybean and or cottonseed oil. And then it goes on uh, cheddar cheese, sour cream, um, coconut oil, and on down. All right, a couple of things you see there. First of all, they list two types of oils. See, that gives them the chance to buy the cheapest oil at the time of manufacturing. And then the second thing they did is they listed several dairy products, whey product, uh, milk products, and so on. And again, they could take and they could put the milk products further down on the list by breaking them up. And so you need to read all the ingredients there, and you see, try and group them a little bit. You may want to avoid dairy products in your diet. And then on all of these lists are things that I presume are additives or preservatives. Oh, yeah confusing. I mean, I don't, I don't know what all those things are, and I can't pronounce half the names. And so it's best to avoid these things. I mean, some people have allergic reactions to them. And, you know, some of them are still under suspect, under concern. And there are some that we do know about, like salt, for example. Yeah, you know that you should be on a low-sodium diet. A lot of people, it's very, very important. And so you want to pick that ingredient out. You're going to pick the sugars out. You're going to look at all the colors and additives and so on. And I think as a general rule, we can say that the least ingredients, the better. And here's a better general rule. How about just not buying things in packages, Dan? Oh, wait a minute. But I get hungry, and I need something fast. Well, there are all kinds of things that you can buy. You know, they call it peripheral shopping in the supermarket, where you shop around the outside, not the inside where all the packages are. And what you buy is you buy the grains and the potatoes and the sweet potatoes and corn and various fruits and vegetables. And you can be certain that those ingredients are all right for you. I mean, after all, they were put in there by nature, and they've got to be right. All right. Uh, you're suggesting, then, that we're going to have to take a new course in label reading in order to protect our health. Yeah, but it's a simple course, Dan. I mean, we have, don't have to make too much out of it. I mean, look at the labels. Think about some things that you know about. If these are dominant, if these are right up at the front of the list in the ingredient list, then put it back. And, you know, you'll go to the supermarket shelf, and you'll find one package of cereal that has a whole list of ingredients. Right next to it will be another package that just has a few things, maybe a whole wheat flour or whole grains in it. And that's the one you want to buy. So do a little comparison shopping, but also, Dan, Keep rereading the labels because, you know, manufacturers will change things on you and then, you know, you could be taking in a whole bunch of salt that you weren't taking in before. Well, the message is we've got to read the labels, that's all. And you keep reading and you keep watching McDougall's Medicine. Thank you. As you know by now, we are what we eat. But there are other things in our lives that keep us healthy. And those are the things that we're going to talk about in the next segment. Dr. John McDougall has been looking into the over-counter remedies for kicking the habit. He joins us now, and I've got to know, is this snake oil or does it do anything? Is it effective? Well, it works for some people. It certainly does help. Now, Lena, I have to tell you, I'm a doctor, okay, and I deal with patients all the time who have addictions to various things, and most commonly, of course, tobacco. But I've really got experience in this field because I smoked two packs a day for 10 years.
You look so healthy. Well, I am healthy. You're a health had, expert. Yes, but that was 16 years ago. And so I've had time to recover. In fact, the recovery is actually very quick. But I know what it's like to be addicted to tobacco. I know what it's like to have my entire life centered around cigarettes. I mean, everything I did. You know, when I went to eat, meetings with friends, getting up in the morning, going to bed at night. Everything was oriented around that, having that cigarette. And every cigarette smoker knows exactly what I'm talking about. And that's one of the things that really disturbed me about, about the tobacco use that I had, is that I was so dependent on it, so d addicted to it. There were other things that bothered me, too. When I got around to quitting, I actually had to formulate. I had to make a list of the reasons that I wanted to quit to get myself ready to do it. Now, you know, you hear about dying or getting emphysema or lung cancer and things like that. That didn't bother a 26-year-old man at all. The reasons that I quit were things that were bothering me at that day. You know, the idea, I had to go into somebody's house and I had to ask for an ashtray. How embarrassing. The way I smelled, I knew I smelled terrible as somebody who smoked. I had to spend money, hard-earned money, on cigarettes. You know, estimates are you spend $1,000 a year supporting this habit. What I could do with $1,000? and the holes that I used to burn in my nice clothes. Now, I made this list, all right, and I got myself ready to quit smoking, and you have to pick this day when you're gonna quit. Today, I'm an addict. My whole life is around cigarettes. Tomorrow, I'm going to be free of that, and it's a real important Im image to form. And you make this list of the reasons you wanna quit, and you repeat it at any quiet moment. It may take you a week or two to go through this list. You get up to that day, and you do it. You suffer for a couple of days, but you've done it. And then at about 10 days out, you run into another problem. You say, look, I beat it. I can just have one cigarette. And you'll only make that mistake once. It's been 16 years, Lena, and I'm still an addict, and I'll never t touch that cigarette again. How much did this kind of thing help? Well, I tried different things. I didn't try these exact products, but I tried a few tranquilizers and some substitutes for nicotine, like I tried cigars, switching to, c yeah, well, Talk about it was not bad. sociable, but, you know, I tried cigars and helped. Uh, but there are other products that you can try that may help a little bit. We have one product here that if you take it and then you smoke, then the cigarettes taste terrible. And we, that works how? Well, what happens is that they have a chemical in the product that uh, reacts poorly with the nicotine, and the nicotine doesn't taste good once you, uh, once you have uh, this substance in your system. It's called Sure Quit. You'd think that immediately you wouldn't want to smoke anymore if it doesn't taste good. Yeah, you would think so. It's only going to help. It's that decision and that commitment that's going to make the difference. These products are not going to do it for you. We have other products that uh, in some way or another, what they do is they relieve the craving, or at least this is what they're supposed to, and they may do so. Here's the greatest craving reliever. It's the actual nicotine in a gum. You buy this, uh, you get it from your doctor. It's prescription. It's called Nick Red Gum, and you can become addicted to it. It's nicotine. Something new. We have, uh, in fact, it's not new. We, we've used this for years with heroin addicts. This is called catapress or clonidine, and when you take it, it changes the nervous system so that you don't get those addictive cravings, or at least they're less. And it works. It just works with tobacco also. You, the it same decreases. way. And these are patches. They're, you can take it as pills, but these are patches, and you put them on your skin, and they stay for a week, and it decreases the cravings. So, your number one recommendation among these products. My number one recommendation is not those products. My number one recommendation is you have to make the commitment. And if you want to use these as an aid or you want to go to an education program, there are programs that will help you through it. There are even live-in programs like at St. Helena Hospital that will help you through it. That's fine, but you really have to make that commitment. So these can only help? They're only a help, and they'll just take and get you maybe over a one or two hurdles onto a better life, onto breathing again on to running up hills and feeling really good. Dr. John McDougall joins us today with an update on one of the most widely used and abused drugs in the world, caffeine. I'm afraid we won't win friends and influence people with this one, John. No, I think we will, Dan. You know, I think people just want the information so they can make informed choices, and so it is with caffeine. Why do you think people drink coffee, Dan? Although I don't know why, I suppose it's because they like the taste of it. Well, that could be in part. I think they develop a taste for it, but I think mainly it's because of the high. I mean, caffeine is a legal stimulant, and it makes them think keener, it picks them up, but like things that pick you up, it also lets you down, and that's one of the adverse effects of caffeine, and people need to know the other side of the story. And so when this caffeine lets you down, you get fatigued, you get depressed, 
and almost everybody gets headaches from caffeine withdrawal. Now, let's talk about the stimulation you get in addition to the mental stimulation which people are looking for. Caffeine stimulates the stomach and causes acid indigestion, aggravates ulcers, stimulates the bowels lower down and causes people to have diarrhea, stimulates the heart and causes the heart to beat stronger and faster and more irregular, blood pressure goes up, disturbing to a lot of people. You get very nervous. You know, even one cup of coffee a day can sometimes disturb the sleep of somebody that evening. Mm -hmm. Stimulates the bladder, and you know what the effects of that are. So you've got to pay the negative price if you're going to get the positive thing that people are looking for, which is the stimulation. So people really feel better when they're doing it in spite of these bad side effects. Well, you know, they get both, and that's the sad thing, Dan, is they don't realize where their problem comes, comes from, like the acid indigestion. And if they know the difference, then they can balance it and make informed choices. Okay, people are in the habit of hot drinks, though. Are there some alternatives? There are. You can have cereal beverages, like Postum, for example. You can have herbal teas. There's always hot water. When it comes to your health, sunshine is a double-edged sword. You need enough, but you can't get too much because it can be dangerous. You need enough sunshine because sunshine produces vitamin D in your skin. And vitamin D is very important for bone growth and the growth of children. Now, people who are light-skinned, they get plenty of sunshine with just casual exposure. And all the vitamin D that they need is made easily. Now, people with dark skin, such as blacks and Asians, their skin needs a lot more sunshine. And they can run into some serious problems if they decide to live in northern latitudes, such as London. When they live in such places, what happens is they don't get enough sunshine and they can develop serious problems called rickets. Now, the other side of the coin is that too much sunshine can be very damaging to your health. Everybody knows what a sunburn is. If you get too much sunshine, you damage the skin and you suffer, don't you? For example, if you get sunburned day in and day out with very strong sun, you can develop early aging. Your skin will not look good as you get older. The other thing is, is that chronic damage to your skin. What happens is that can turn into skin cancer, and a very rare form of these skin cancers can actually take your life. So you must be very careful. The initial step to protecting your skin from sunshine is wear a good hat and other protective clothing. If you're going to go out on the beach, it's a good idea to use very good sun lotions. Sun lotions that contain TABA. And you notice your sun lotions, they have a number on them. The higher the number, the stronger the protection. So you be the judge as to how much sunshine you should get and how much protection that you really need. You know, I'm Irish, and my skin is made for somebody who should live in Ireland. But I choose to live in Hawaii, so I take special precautions. So next time you're out in the sunshine, please consider the right amount of sunshine for you. You know, every once in a while I have a chance to get away and really think about things. And one of the things I was thinking about today was the importance of stress in people's lives and in their health. Well, we hear all the time that stress is a real important factor as far as causing disease. But you know, the diseases that people suffer from these days, heart disease, high blood pressure, diabetes, cancer, I mean, these are diseases that have only been around 100, 150 years. How about stress? Stress has been with people for thousands and thousands of years. People have had problems with their families. They've had problems with money. They've had wars and famines. Stress is not a new thing but the diseases we have really are. You know, as a doctor, I get a chance to really know people. I get a chance to ask them personal questions and really understand their lives. And I'll have to tell you, in my experience of 15 years or so, I've gotten to know that most of us are about the same. We put one foot in front of the other every day, and we just make it through the day. Oh, maybe 2% of the population has it real tough. I mean, stress does really hurt their lives. And maybe another 2%, I mean, stress-free. They just feel great. But for most of us, it's the same. You know how stress hurts us? Stress makes us do harmful things to ourselves. It makes us drink more alcohol, more coffee, eat more rich food, keeps us from getting proper rest. That's where stress really does the harm. You know, stress can be looked at from another point of view, and that is stress does some positive things in our lives. Think about it. Think about where you are today. I mean, stress got you to get the job done and the problem resolved. And that's why you're the success that you are. You know, we could use stress as a very positive thing in our lives. And that's the way I'd like you to think about it. You're probably wondering if I forgot about exercise. Not a chance. But don't be afraid. Exercise can be fun and easy no matter what your age. 
So try and remember where you stored your exercise bike, walking shoes, and garden tools while you're watching these segments. We're here at Oshman Sporting Goods in my hometown of Santa Rosa, California to find out about home exercise equipment. Joining us is Dave Chapman. Welcome, Dave. Thanks for coming by, John. Tell me about this machine I'm on. Well, the machine you're on is a stationary exercise bicycle. Essentially what it's designed for is to be a low-impact aerobic exercise machine. It helps to work out the circulatory and the respiratory system as well as the lower body. Well, why this instead of a regular bike? Well, it provides more of a controlled environment for a person to exercise in. You don't have the dangerous variables of being out on the street or on a trail. Then what about these gauges down here? Sure, there are certain gauges on here that allow for the person who's working out to keep track of how long they've been going, the distance that they've traveled, the calories, and even a target heart rate if they are unable to exceed a certain amount of exercise. Is there anything else you can show me in exercise bikes? Oh, it certainly is. I have some more right here. Dave, this looks like the Cadillac of exercise bikes. Why would I want to invest my money in this? Well, a bike like this tends to provide a little bit more in the area of options. Uh, as you can see, it's a dual action bike, meaning that the handlebars move also. What that does is it helps you out in upper body, and it also increases the aerobic workout for the circulatory and the respiratory system, as well as working on the lower body. What are these bars for, Dave? Well, what you can do is you can just put your feet up on the top here and just use the rowing action to give you that upper body workout. Are there any other positions? Sure, you can just put your feet on the pedals and just work like a regular stationary bike, not holding on to the handles. What else you got to show me? Some pretty interesting stuff. Oh, I like this rowing machine. Well, the rowing machine is probably one of the best all-around exercise piece of equipment you can get in the sense that it works several different types of muscle groups. It works the back, it works the legs, it works abdominal muscles, as well as a great cardiovascular and respiratory workout. Up to this point, how much does this equipment cost? You can get any of these pieces of equipment for under $300. You have one more piece of equipment to show me? You bet. Uh, Dave, this looks like a little bit more expensive piece of equipment. Well, that's true, but it is a much more involved piece of equipment. This is a running treadmill, and the name's a little deceptive because it does go anywhere from a slow walk all the way up to a quick jog. It has monitoring systems for a person to keep track of their particular workout. The thing that's good about a treadmill is that it takes the running phase and puts it into a controlled environment, much like when we were speaking about the exercise bicycle. And they can keep track of all that uh, workout with the electronic monitoring systems. Plus, I can watch the news. That would be one thing you could do. Are there any age restrictions on this kind of equipment? As far as any of the equipment I've shown you, just about any age group can use it. I do recommend that anyone who is thinking about buying exercise equipment just check into the type of workout they want before they do spend the money. Dave, I want to thank you for a very interesting segment. Well, you're certainly welcome, John. But I do think you should go a little bit faster in order to get well, a better maybe, workout. Well, maybe just a little bit. No, no, I, no I, that's, that's honestly, fast enough, Dave. A little Dave. bit faster. That, that's really fast enough. A little bit faster. That's fast enough. Fast enough. That's good. Many of you are interested in jogging, and that's good. But more and more of you are suffering from injuries of your knees and ankles related to the jogging, and that's bad. But there are alternatives, such as bicycling, and that's what this segment is about. Are you ready, gang? Well, let's go. You know, my family really enjoys bicycle riding, and according to Time Magazine, so do 17 million of you. Now, as far as calories are concerned, we're talking about approximately 200 calories every half hour. Come on in and I'll show you a little bit more about the effects of jogging and bicycle riding on your joints.
there's a big difference between jogging and bicycling as far as the effects upon the joints. I want you to take a look here at the knee joint. You have the kneecap, we have the upper leg bone, and we have the lower leg bones, and then in between we have cushions and we have ligaments. Now jogging can put tremendous stress on these cushions and ligaments while you're pounding along on the pavement. And if you step in a hole you can take and you can actually stretch these ligaments out and you can tear them. Whereas bicycling is nice and smooth, not traumatic at all, very easy on the joints. I think you have a real choice when it comes to exercise. You know, I find a lot of joggers, they're changing. They injure themselves and they find out that all they can do now to keep in shape is to get on that bicycle. Now take a look at Grandpa's knees. Now this is nice, smooth activity. There's no jarring there like you'd get with jogging. This is very safe. This is wholesome exercise. Now you could get yourself a stationary bike like this and you could make it even safer. You wouldn't have to deal with the traffic. Now you've probably got a bicycle. Go out and look in your garage, find it, dust it off, and go out and have some fun. Exercise is a really important part of a total health picture. You need to find an exercise that you really enjoy. I'm here out at the ocean and this is where I really enjoy getting my exercise. I like swimming, I like skin diving, and I really enjoy windsurfing. Now it's up to you to find something that you also enjoy. I mean, maybe it's dancing, could be bicycling, swimming, maybe tennis. But find that exercise that you enjoy so that you keep doing it every day. And you keep that exercise profile up in a part of your total health picture. Now if you exercise, there are certain benefits. Some of them you know of very well. For example, when you exercise, you burn calories. And those of us who are overweight, we lose excess weight easily by burning those extra calories. When you hit trim weight, you know what you get to do. You get to eat a lot more food when you exercise. And boy, do I like to eat. There are other benefits to exercising. For example, it keeps your body looking good, keeps you feeling good, relieves minor anxiety and depression. And your doctor is concerned about certain things that exercise benefits also. For example, your cholesterol will come down, and so will your blood pressure. And the total result of these things is that you will live longer and healthier. An exercise program should be started with some consideration as to what kind of shape you're in right now. For example, if you haven't exercised very much, you want to start out at a reasonable level. And then what you want to do is slowly build up so that you take and gradually get your body into the condition it should be in. So when you plan your daily exercise routine, pick something you really enjoy. And then start out at a level that's really comfortable for you. I often find my father-in-law in his garden. He's having such a great time. It looks like he's getting a lot of exercise. He's singing, enjoying himself. You know, he spends so much time in the garden. Why do you spend so much time out here? It's good exercise. You have such beautiful plants. They seem to grow so strong. How do you get them to uh, grow so nicely? What kind of fertilizers do you use? Compost and natural manures. And I notice there aren't any bugs in any of your plants here. How do you keep the bugs away? Certain flowers. Most flowers attract certain kind of bugs that kill the bad bugs. I see. So it's kind of a balance. Balance. Natural balance. You know, you got, I'm sure, a lot of problems at home and at work. Uh, what do you think about when you come out in the garden? Oh, just relaxes everything. You forget everything. All your problems. Just think about your plants? Just think about plants. You know, I hear you singing out here, too, and I hear you singing uh, religious songs. Well, back to nature and what God has made. Does that help you relax, too? You bet. Most people talk about gardening as a hobby. It's much, much more physical than that. I mean, people are up and down. They stretch muscles. They have to lift things. You burn almost 200 calories an hour when you garden. This is a sport. Dad, how old are you? 76. 76 years old and a gardener. You could look like that if you gardened when you're 76. I bet even I could. Any time of the year is a good time to start thinking about gardening. Now why don't you go out in your yard and find that spot where you're going to relax, where you're going to get your exercise, the place you're going to start that special garden, and pretty soon you'll be reaping the fruits of your labor. It's hard to have fun if you're not healthy, but by now you have the keys to good health. So get out there and enjoy yourself. I do all the time. Here are some of the segments we did just for fun.
It seems like almost everyone has a basic urge for adventure, to really break free now and then, to rise above the trees and the houses and the fields, and to see things from a slightly different perspective. It feels good to see the world from way up high. And why not? The air is clear. The movement is slow, almost dreamlike. The burners on the balloons do make some noise, but you get used to it. And after that, it's actually quite relaxing. It's amazing how all the, all the green and the brown. Like a patchwork quilt. Yeah, yeah. Perfectly. Aren't they? Okay. Looks like somebody really knew how to plow a straight line. Yeah. What do you think? Are we going to pick a little corn and leave? Oh. Yeah. That's how you get it, 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 part of dinner, huh? Part of the night's meal. They're amazing. You can touch the tops of the corn. Oh, yeah. the balloon, it's almost like um, like there's a mirror around it. Some kind of reflection. There are a lot of theories about why it's so nice up here. Some say it's because the air is filled with negative ions, which make you feel good. But it doesn't matter if you believe in negative ions or not. You never have to have a reason to feel good, especially in a balloon. Unfortunately, you may not have the luxury of taking a balloon ride over California's Central Valley whenever you need to relax. But that's not reason enough not to get away when you need a break. So find a hillside you can walk to, anywhere you can go to take an unhurried look at the world around you. And you know what? Before you know it, you'll feel the tension begin to melt away. At one time or another, most of you have heard of people taking mud baths. And I bet some of you have even tried it. People have been doing it for centuries. And you know, I'm basically a curious person. So I decided to bring the cameras of Christian Lifestyle magazine to the Golden Haven Spa in Calistoga, California to investigate. And I brought my father-in-law here along for moral support. Let's go inside. When they say mud bath, they weren't kidding. I mean, this is something my kids would play in. I'm talking to Michelle Androvich, and she's the general manager of the spa here. Michelle, can you tell me what this is made of? Okay, it's a special formula of clay, peat moss, and volcanic ash. And tell me, what's it supposed to do for me? It really does relax you and take the toxins out of your body. Does it feel good? It's your turn to try. You want to give it a try? All right. Michelle, it feels like I'm floating. You are. The special formula allows your body to float because the mud is the same consistency as the, your internal organs. If you think about it, there aren't many times when you're able to have your body floating like this. So your muscles are really relaxing and your spine is able to just relax a little bit more. You know, some people have expressed concern about the cleanliness of mud baths. Yeah, we get that question a lot. Um, we have a system here with the mineral water. The mineral water comes out of the ground at about 140 to 160 degrees. Consequently, we, between each bath, each customer, we'll put the water on the tub and sterilize the mud. Sounds good. It is. After the mud bath comes the mineral bath. Michelle tells me this water comes from 400 feet under the ground. Europeans have been enjoying mineral baths for centuries, and now I know why. Am I any healthier? Well, I'll tell you, I sure feel like it. How about you, Dad? Each year, 235 million of you come to theme parks. You spend over $4 billion. Recently, I brought my family here to Great America in Santa Clara, California. 
And what I noticed were signs like this. These signs suggest that it could be hazardous to ride rides if you're pregnant, if you have heart disease, or you have high blood pressure. Now, when I notice something like this, I have to find out more. And that's what I'm here to investigate. Bye. Enjoy your ride. I'd like you to meet Lisa Shannon. She's the spokesperson for Great America. Lisa, how about it? What do those signs really mean? Is it dangerous? I think you mean our fun and safety signs that you see posted at all the major rides here at Great America. And those signs offer what I consider good common sense advice. Um, that you, for any unusual health reasons or pregnancy or um, height restrictions, certain people should not ride the roller coasters. Lisa, one part of the sign suggests heart trouble. Is it likely that somebody's to be scared to death when they ride these rides? 